Hi, and welcome to the Earth Science Classroom video uh, on volcanoes. We're looking at the stratovolcano, or composite volcano, the most classic and most common type of volcano we get on our planet. And first, we're going to look at the definitions and the formation, which will include the magma and obviously lava. We're going to look at the anatomy of a generic stratovolcano, composite volcano. And we're going to look at the features and the, the characteristics we expect to find on our very large classic volcano. And the fifth part is the location, location, location. How these volcanoes are made, where they're made, and where we find them, and also the examples. Always good to have examples of these volcanoes. So let's delve into the uh, definitions. So strato comes from strata, which means layers, layer. And so it's a layered volcano. And then composite means that it's made of different parts. So we're looking at a volcano which is made of different parts and is, has layers. And this technically is a mixed eruption volcano. So we'll get to that later in the video. I'm going to leave the definitions on top. We're going to discuss now the formation. And the formation comes, obviously, volcanoes need magma as a source to produce lava on the surface which defines volcanoes. And don't forget, volcano could be any crack or hole or fracture where the magma is allowed to rise up through decompression, through various uh, processes, convection currents, and produce lava on the surface. So it doesn't have to be this, this uh, beautiful volcano, it could just be a crack in the floor. And that's how it starts. So let's have our surface. Here's our surface, and here is our magma chain. And it's in the crust, uh, maybe a few kilometers down, and the magma will start to uh, make its way up through the upper part of the crust, which we have here. Let's say it's conical crust, so it's mostly granitic, and it's thick. So up comes the magma, and let's say it starts to find a weak area of the crust, and it is going to spread this brittle crust, which means easily broken under pressure. There's no real elastic property, it's going to break. It's going to cause a fracture to begin with, and that's going to allow the magma to flow up onto the surface, and there will be an eruption. Now, I mentioned as a mixed eruption of volcano. That means that there is a eruption with lava, as you can see right here. We have lava flowing out from that initial vent, that initial fracture, where the volcano starts on the surface of the Earth. And then there'll be a, a period of eruptions where you'll have ash cloud, and you'll have tephra. Now, tephra is the word that means all different sizes of of pyroclastic material that comes out of the volcano. So it can be small bits, medium-sized bits, or very large bits, and they're all under the name tephra, okay? And we know it as the ash cloud, and that contains the tephra, which is different sized material. So we've got the lava, and we have the ash cloud. So these ash deposits kind of sit on top of the lava flow, and they make this kind of like layer cake. You have a layer of lava, then a layer of ash, or tephra deposits, then another layer of lava and ash, the massive layer cake. And that's how we get the word composite. And because they are basically horizontal or kind of like beds of different materials, is how we have the strata, because it's layered, it's layered. Okay, so that's how it begins. So let's look at the anatomy. So let's look over to the left-hand side where I've drawn this little area here. And I've drawn the magma chamber, I've drawn the original like starting point for this big strato or composite volcano. It will start at the, the surface of the, uh, of the Earth. And the lava comes out, so you have lava, and you have then the uh, tephra deposits, and they start to layer up. Now, why is the magma so important? Because the magma is going to dictate and control the size, the shape, of the volcano, it's gonna dictate the gas content, it's gonna dictate whether it is going to be more felsic magma or, or mafic magma, and that will control the eruptions, that will control how long in between the eruptions there is, basically. So everything comes down to the magma. 
Now, most of the magma that comes through uh, stratovolcanoes is going to be undecidic. Occasionally, it's going to be rhyolitic. One of the one is in between, which is decidic or dacite magma. So these are all generally medium to high silica. Now, as we know, that controls viscosity, so it'll be medium to high viscosity, which is the uh, technically the amount of movement or resistance to flow that the magma does. And so it's going to be thicker magma. It's going to trap more gases. So you're going to have higher gas content, and it's going to flow a short distance, which is key because this short distance means that the volcano will grow tall, but stay somewhat narrow. That it's still a cone shape. It still can be symmetrical, but it is going to be taller than it is wider. Now, as you can see, the slope angle as drawn this big diagram here, the slope angle does change from the base of the volcano to the summit where the crater is. But if we look at here, the lava is going to flow out and there's going to be ash and then lava and then ash and lava and ash. And every time this central kind of pipe that we call a conduit, it's going to grow and be more extensive and be more pipes or more dikes. We call these dikes. So D, Y, I, D, dikes. And this is our conduit, our central pipe, basically connecting the, the crater to the magma chamber. And, we have these, and as the volcano grows, so does this system of pipes and connectivity between the vent and the chamber. So technically, the larger the volcano, the more kind of access to the outside world the lava has in terms of flank eruptions, in terms of different kinds of volcanoes can form on the side of the original uh, strata. So you start to get this classic volcano shape formed from the alternating layers of lava and ash. Again, why we call it a composite and why we call it a strato, because it's layered and it's a different thing. Now going back to the magma, this magma is felsic. So it's generally low in magnesium, low in iron and low in calcium, but it does compensate by being higher in potassium and higher in sodium. So this would be a thicker, higher gas content uh, magma that has the potential to uh, create more explosive eruptions. Now these eruptions are to be multi-stage eruptions with lava and ash, obviously, because that's how it's built. And the fumaroles would produce the gas as a, as a way out. The gas is also trapped in the magma, which would lead to a longer period of time between eruptions. This is called the repo. Now, going back to the slope, the slope angle is very important. The slope angle could be as low as 10 degrees at the base, but rising up to between 30 and 40 degrees slope angle towards the upper part of the volcano towards the summit and the crater. So it's kind of like it's very narrow, narrow towards the top and it has a larger base. Now in terms of the features, we can have um, the dikes and you can also have sills, which are more horizontal. Okay, these are sills inside the uh, volcano. You can also have a lava dome inside the crater, which would be hardened lava made from more, this is more rhyolitic and they're smaller in the crater, showing activity. You could also have a parasitic cone on the side, it kind of grows on the side or the flank. This is also called a flank, the side of the volcano, a parasitic cone. You could also have a scoria cone, it's a crater like that. Scoria cone is just made from tephra and ash deposits. They're very, very small and they usually accumulate around the sides of these larger stratos because when the strato does erupt, various ash and pyroclastic material, they do fall down as tephra and accumulate in these small, less than 300 meter high scoria cones, scoria or cinder cones. Now these are their own volcanoes by themselves, but they can also be on the sides of these big giant stratos. For example, Mount Etna has a collection of cinders right on the uh, flanks of its own volcano. You can also have a lateral blast, which means that the eruption would not go vertical, that she goes sideways. It's a lateral blast. And, it was, and obviously the famous one in America was Mount St. Helens in 1980, where there was 
a, um, a very large earthquake, causing a landslide, the largest one in recorded history, and caused the volcano to erupt sideways that took towards the north, uh, which was actually very, very impressive, but not for the people that were on the wrong side at the wrong time and lost their lives. But apart from that, it was very, very impressive. So let's talk, talk location and facts. Well, basically, stratos are the most common. Okay, so of the one and a half thousand active volcanoes in the world, about 60%, that's 50% of them are strato or composites. And the last 10,000 years, we've seen about nearly 700 stratos uh, active and erupting. And most of these volcanoes, or their stratos or other ones, most of them, 80% are on land. Now, why is that? We'll get to that soon. So most of the location is around the Ring of Fire. More importantly, around the Pacific Ocean, the Pacific Ocean Ring. So where the Pacific meets the different continents. And you have North America, you have uh, Eurasia, you have South America, and you have uh, Australasia. So you have a large area of continuous volcanic regions, of which the four largest eruptions have been around the Ring of Fire. You have Nova Rupta in 1912, you have uh, Tambora, in 1880, uh, Krakatoa in 1700s, you had Toba as well, which is in Indonesia. Again, all these around the Ring of Fire. And they're massive eruptions. And they're all either very large stratos or large calderas. So where is Ring of Fire? Ring of Fire is basically the edge of the Pacific Ocean. So if you have the Pacific Ocean, right here and you had uh, let's say south america okay and uh, america and then you have alaska and you have russia and down here okay just very briefly and then down into china and then into southeast asia around and you had australia right here you know, new zealand right here and you had uh, borneo and these parts of Indonesia right here, you know, the Philippines and Japan, you know, so South Korea right here. You had all these different islands, Indonesia, Malaysia, over here, Cambodia, all right, and Australia. So this, there are volcanoes all around here, all around here, kind of miss out Australia, some in the Philippines as well, all around here through Indonesia and Sumatra, Malaysia, up through Japan. Japan's like a, a bottleneck for like four different plates. Russia into, oh, sorry, I've got the Aleutian Islands right here, which is very important. Through the Aleutian Islands, through Alaska, through Canada, and through the Northwest of America. They have a little break around the uh, Southern California, back into a bit of Mexico, and then through down into South America. There's Brazil. There we go. So down into south america all the way down through so again that's an extremely long continuous line now why well if we do a little diagram we have a nice convergent plate boundary if you check out my boundary videos you'll learn a lot more about these boundaries and why they occur and how they occur and the processes that are linked with them but you have this basic um oceanic plate which is the pacific ocean massive ocean plate or oceanic crust which is dense and basaltic rock, and it is also thin. And here is my ocean crust. It is moving through plate tectonics, through movement of the convection currents in the asthenosphere. Convergent plate boundary, so convergent. Convergent ocean to continental. And you have subduction, which is right here, but sub. And it's basically the density of the, uh, the slab, the slab pull is moving it down deeper into an area where it is hot enough to melt and the plate and the actual friction and the release of water uh, from the minerals allows the uh, rocks melting point to lower making it easier to melt the rock at a certain depth about 150 kilometers and the melting plate creates melt which is a liquid form of magma and up it goes up it goes up it goes through this thick continental crust, we have the ocean crust over here, and voila, we get to the surface of the continental crust, as I drew earlier, and we get our little volcano, not little, but our very large strato. And this occurs all along the coastline, a certain distance from 
where the ocean plate meets coral plate, and you get this long line called a volcanic chain or volcanic arc, and it's a long continuous line as shown by the Pacific Ring of Fire, this long continuous arc all around the edge of the Pacific Ocean where you'll find subduction and trenches and melting. And this is why this is a felsic, felsic magma based on the water, based on the potassium and sodium and the depth of which it melts. The plate as well, this cold plate, you get this thick magma and you get the very large eruptions and, and uh, explosions from these, these uh, very large uh, volcanoes all around the Pacific Ring of Fire. This is the Earth Science Classroom. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the content. Uh, check out more videos on our channel and don't forget to subscribe. Thank you again.